Hi everyone, so welcome back. Uh, next off, we have Dr. Donnie Adams, who will speak to us on pedagogical strategies for virtual schools. Well, with the virtual domain coming in, you know, things can't be entirely the same. We don't want to have old wine in new wine skin. So let's invite Dr. Donnie Adams to speak to us. A very good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Donny Adams from the University of Malaya. Firstly, I'd like to thank University College Fairview for giving me this opportunity to speak at this webinar titled The Virtual School, Delivering Sustainable Education Beyond COVID-19. The topic that I will be sharing with you today is on pedagogical strategies for virtual schools. A very pertinent topic, a very important topic, especially at these difficult times. So firstly, I'd like to introduce to all of you some catchphrases, what we envision education should be. How should education be in the next five years, in the next 10 years? So among the famous catchphrases that we often come across are such as reimagining education. So we know education how it is, as it is, and we would like to reimagine how education could be in the future. What can it be done better? What we can do better? We also have this term called revitalizing education. So we know that um, there are some fundamental things to keep. There are some fundamental things that cannot be changed in education, but what kind of new elements that we could introduce that could revitalize the curriculum, could revitalize the education, could revitalize the syllabus that we already have. And the most uh, famous catch uh, phrase that we often hear is 21st century education. How we could teach our youngsters, who, how we could teach our children and students on um, adapting, on embracing 21st century skills, how we could best equip them uh, for the workplaces, to, for job opportunities, how we could best equip them for the 21st century world that we have now. But unfortunately, uh, we have a new term now that we call the new normal in education. So what is the new normal in education? Here I have a picture that I'd like to show you. Um, I'm sure you can guess what picture is this. This is a picture of a lecture hall. So we could see that um, the lecture hall is first of all empty. There is no 
um, students. There is no lectures, there's no activity. We just have an empty lecture hall. Another picture that I can show you is something that uh, those who are in the university could be familiar with. Um, this is another picture of an auditorium. So you have about a close capacity of three to 400 students um, who could easily sit in, in this auditorium. But again, we can see that this auditorium is empty. There is no students, there's no lecturers, there's not any single activity in this room. Is this what we call the new normal? in education. Another picture that I could show you is a picture that we could relate to in schools. So here we see some desks and some stools, but what we could only see in this picture are just an empty classroom. There's no students, there's no teachers, there's no activity. The stools are on top of the table. There's nothing scribbled on the board. Is this the new normal in education? Another picture that um, is very similar to the one on the left, is another picture of another classroom. So again, we could see that, again, there's no students, there's no teachers, there's no activities. Is this what we call the new normal in education? What is the new normal in education? Now we could see a very unfamiliar sight, um, something that we have not seen before, or perhaps that something that we have not seen on a large scale that is almost being done on every part of the world, um, uh, being adapted by every part, uh, every learning institutions in the world. So what do we see in the first picture? We see a child who is holding his textbook and there's a laptop, there's a headphone, and he's all alone. There's no friends, there's no peers. He is at the comfort of his home and he is placing his laptop and he is trying to learn the best way that he can. Another picture that we can see is a girl that is sitting and learning from a tablet. And here she's trying to scribble some notes and to take down some notes. And we could see that in the tablet, we could see the faces of a teacher and the faces of her classmates. Another picture that we can see in the new normal is a picture of a child um, staring away into the laptop, is staring away into the lesson, trying to focus, trying to understand what is happening virtually? What is the teacher teaching virtually? And there is no one to talk to. There's no one to play with. Uh, there's no one to look at. It's just the child and the machine. So this is what we call the new normal. We also see a new normal in terms of educators talking to screen. Uh, when we talk to educators, they'll say that this is the most challenging part because they can't see the students. There's no... Uh, facial expression, most of the students could not turn on their cameras because of the uh, bandwidth capacity that is low and this will disrupt the connectivity. And most of the time they could only see the names of the students. So they're merely talking to screens. They're merely looking at their materials, merely looking at PowerPoint slides. This is the new normal. Another new normal that I could show you is here we have a teacher uh, in school, okay, but this time, is only the teacher in school. The kids are not in school. The kids are facing uh, the teachers tr uh, through a television, through a screen. So we can see in the background that the kids are interacting with the teachers. It's just that they're not physically present in the school. So the teachers are interacting with a television set with her students in it. And they are having a teaching and learning session. This is the new normal. Uh, another thing that I would like to share with you, this is a, 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 something that is very extraordinary, I find, that this is an educator that is teaching his class at the moment. So we could see that he is at the comfort of his home, um, no formal attire, no office wear. And what do, what do we see that is surrounding him? He could uh, take um, a sip of coffee or tea at his leisure at any time he wants. Um, he's sitting comfortably there. Uh, with his own attire and what kind of equipments does he have? He have a headphone. Um, of course, he has his mug um, to, to, to drink coffee from. And we see that he's wearing a, a shorts there uh, while teaching. And also as well, he has a laptop there and he has a light um, focusing on his laptop. He has a webcam there. So among all, the, among all these equipments, we can see that this is the new normal. The, this is what educators are being equipped. And we can also see that he easily has three laptops with one tablet facing him. So this is a, a new normal that we have started to embrace. This is the new normal in education that we are looking at. 
So what triggered this evolution? What triggered this drastic change? What triggered empty classrooms? What triggered um, teachers working behind screens and looking at screens? Or was it months of planning and discussion that has gone through? Did we consult um, experts to come up uh, with this new normal of education? Was there a lot of training and professional development that was conducted to embrace this change? Uh, was there any test, pre and post test that was conducted to, to, to see the visible effects of this? Is it uh, prudent? Is it a good strategy? Was any research and surveys conducted um, to, to, to evaluate the impact of this new um, education? Or even just simply, did we have a new education minister? So what was the trigger? And we, we noticed that none of this was actually the trigger for the new normal education, none of this drastic change. The trigger was simply a small virus, a virus called COVID-19, a virus that is visible only through the microscope. Um, so the trigger that has hit the world uh, massively and brought everything to a standstill and education had to shift from classroom to virtual. Um, schools had to shift from being physically present to a virtual school. So it's not easy for us to imagine, let alone change, um, unless there is a circumstance that forced us to. So in this case, COVID-19 has forced us to change, has forced us to go virtual. So what is our target in the new normal in education? We first need to unlearn what we have always known. What do we need to unlearn? First, we need to unlearn that schools are not just limited to rows of desks. Second, we have to unlearn the concept that education doesn't just take place in lecture halls. We need to unlearn that assessment doesn't have to be done in schools. A public exams doesn't have to be physically present in schools where everyone is at a place and there's a facilitator and students are answering exam questions in schools. We have to unlearn that uh, reading materials does not necessarily needs to be heavy. It uh, has to be in a school bag. I don't, we have to unlearn that you, uh, the ways that uh, going to school requires you to bring a heavy load of school bag. We need to unlearn what we have always known. Now, to embrace the new normal in education, to embrace virtual school, we have to understand that it takes three elements um, to put uh, um, to embrace the new normal, to embrace virtual schools. We have the student, we have the teachers, we have the parents. Uh, previously, we could only depend so much on the teachers and the students. There was just two relationships, but now parents play a very vital role. And due to this, we have to repair what broken parent-teacher communications that we often see happening in schools. We need to unlearn all this only then we can establish the new normal of education. So here are four pedagogical strategies uh, for us to transition to a virtual school. What can we do uh, to embrace this change ahead? So number one, there we need to uh, embrace a strategy of shifting learning space, shifting our teaching methods, shifting our learning evaluations, shifting responsibility in the teaching and learning process. So if we look at shifting the learning spaces, instead of going to school and university to learn, we now embrace and understand that learning happens at home within personal spaces. This is the virtual school that we have now. Um, we also embrace that there is a shift in our social interaction from being physically present in school to being a virtual school now. So interactions doesn't necessarily have to be physical in schools where we see each other, where we touch each other, where we embrace each other, where we, where we look at each other. Now we could interact with one another virtually. We could still interact, we could still converse with the classmates, we still can converse with the teachers, we still can converse with the lecturers. We are not cut off, we are just merely shifted our communication channels from being physically present to a virtual environment. Secondly, then we need to shift our teaching methods. So instead of embracing a one size fit all 
that all students are taught the same thing. They are listening to the same lecture, doing the same activities, completing the same homework, sitting for the same exam, and eventually being evaluated on the same rubric. Uh, we now need to embrace differentiated learning. Um, uh, what does it mean by this? That each student can now learn the curriculum. They could now learn um, um, the, they could now learn at their own pace, at their own speed, and they could use different resources based on their particular learning needs. Uh, what is a virtual school like now? Is it better for students to watch videos? Is it better to read a textbook? Now, in a virtual school, the students could choose his or her way's own of learning. They could choose to watch videos that they find best fits their learning needs. They could choose to read an ebook, uh, which they find best meets their learning needs. So learning actually takes place in their own personal space. Uh, number three, we look at shifting responsibility in the teaching and learning process. So usually uh, now uh, in a virtual school, learning takes place in a personal space. Um, where family members are the learning facilitators in the learning and the teaching and learning process. So we have the parents who is playing a very vital role now. Parents has to play a very vital role. And the other siblings of the students have to play a very vital role. They are now the learning facilitators in the teaching and learning process. So showing some real life examples, giving demonstrations for the lessons. Um, so if the teachers are teaching something, the parents and the older siblings could give some examples. They could demonstrate what the teachers are teaching virtually so that the students that is learning could actually understand. And family members has to be present. They need to be present to facilitate the learning process. So for example, this is a picture. So the child is uh, probably feeling very tensed up because perhaps uh, there is the need to ask questions. There's a need to, to learn something at a, a, a very, um, condensed period at, at, at their own pace. There's nobody to talk to, there's nobody, and a family members has to be present at that moment to give them that comfort, to give them the, the confidence that uh, uh, things are okay and that you are there to be present and supporting them in the learning environment. Uh, number four, there has to be shift uh, in terms of how we evaluate learning. So from um, depending solely on summative assessment, final exams, we now have to emphasize more on formative assessment. There must be a form of uh, evaluating learning alternatively. How do we monitor student achievement? We need to shift our focus from assessment of learning, which is gradings to assessment for learning, which we use formative assessments to see whether the students has achieved the intended learning outcome and whether they need some extra helps to master a certain topic. So these are some examples of formative assessments. Uh, we could observe the students um, in terms of uh, their body language, their eye context. So are they understanding us uh, when we teach? We could, uh, we could do some Q&A question and answer. We can discuss something. We can give them some projects. We could do some quizzes and not necessarily needs to be graded for that. Uh, we could ask them to come up with some graphic. We can ask them to do some presentations. So these are some uh, ways that we can assess our students formatively. And these are some important tools that we could use. So uh, we, uh, some of the uh, well-known formative assessment tools are like Google Classroom. We can use Padlet, Kahoot. So these are some of the important tools that you can use um, um, to um, assess your students formatively. So online learning is here to stay um, and online learning enables learning. So it's time that we embrace virtual school. It's time that we, we embrace the strategies towards this virtual school. So some considerations uh, as we embrace uh, the strategies of virtual schools, we need to be aware of the amount of time it takes students to complete their activities. Uh, we need to understand that uh, students are now required to be more independent in their learning. And we need to also understand that uh, students are now learning at their own uh, pace, at their own personal space. And uh, this requires them to be moved out. Uh, this requires them to be out of their comfort zone, which is usually based in schools and among their peers. Uh, 
uh, we also need to consider about students' ability to use technologies may vary. Some of the best practices is we provide opportunities uh, for interactive and collaborative learning. Let it not just be a one way where the teacher just speaks and the student just listen. Please ensure that there is some interaction, there's some collaborative learning. You could use some uh, web tools, like uh, uh, use some formative assessments to get the class engaged. Um, you could provide some digital and printed text. Um, so digital text is quite easy that you can just uh, send it through emails, you can send it through social media, but print text perhaps will take a little bit of uh, uh, time where uh, you could possibly post the text uh, to your students. Post video lectures, um, not all students prefer to read. Uh, some of them learn best uh, through watching videos and listening to videos. So uh, help to bridge the gap between teachers and students when you are not meeting face to face. And um, assessment needs to be adapted to fit e-learning expectations. So as what I mentioned earlier, uh, lesser on summative assessment, more on formative assessment. So the conclusion, for this is the new normal in education is not just a matter of transferring our traditional course to e-learning. It's not just transferring uh, schools, physical schools to virtual schools. Instead, it involves um, a form of developing and engaging online learning activities. So here we could look at three important factors, which are the course design, the communications and motivations that could possibly affect the success of online learning. Um, so I would like to end this presentation with a positive note to all of you. Um, as compared to a, a physically, uh, uh, as compared to students being physically present in school, um, a study says that they only learn eight to ten percent. They retain only eight to ten percent of learning being physically present in a classroom. But if um, in a virtual school, the student actually retain twenty-five to sixty percent of learning materials and learning that they have obtained. So this is a positive message to all of us. This is the new normal. We, uh, this is some of the strategies that I've shared for, uh, uh, to all of you to embrace some pedagog pedagogical strategies towards a virtual school. So thank you everyone and thank you for your attention.